So, hi everyone. Welcome to another Sunday Zoom meeting and indeed another podcast episode. If you're listening, you can find out more about the podcast, uh, the Facebook community, and how to get involved in these uh, Zoom meetings if you go to the website, which is www.acimwithkeith.com. Also, if you're interested, you can find information there on private coaching with me, which can be just a single session or booking sessions uh, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or whatever suits. Okay, so um, this week's meeting. I, as ever, I sort of take my inspiration for these meetings from what's been happening in the group. And I suppose this this two things has been coming up in the group. Um, the first is the question of, as Ken said, the right mind is a non-judgmental observer of the wrong mind. Um, he said right-mindedness is looking at the ego without judgment. Right-mindedness is looking at the wrong mind without judgment. And so we can call the right mind awareness. That's what it is. Looking at something with no judgment of it is just simply awareness. And so in the Holy Spirit, what we are is awareness. In our wrong mind, we're a person. And a person is a body and an insane voice talking to itself. So that's that's the wrong mind. And I guess it takes us a while in studying the corpse <laughs> to realize that the wrong mind is what you think is your personality and your story. So that's your wrong mind. Because the wrong mind, the ego, is the belief in separateness. That something can exist in isolation from the whole. And it can't. Uh, so that's the first thing I wanted to do a little bit of a deep dive into today. And it's to me, it does kind of tie in nicely with another discussion that we were having in the group. And this is the idea of, um, you know, suffering because of the suffering of animals, animals being slaughtered uh, for food. And it's the same thing as saying, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm disturbed or I'm suffering because of the war that's happening in Ukraine, or I'm suffering and I'm disturbed because there's been an incident or a shooting or there's, you know, been a death of a child or there's, it's the same thing. So that's the two areas I wanted to do a little bit of a deep dive into today. Um, so let's take some readings from the course. Let's go to... Let me dig something out here. Let's go to chapter 28, The Undoing of Fear, and go to section two, Reversing Cause and Effect. And we're down in paragraph seven. The miracle establishes you dream a dream and that its content is not true. This is a crucial step in dealing with illusions. No one is afraid of them when he perceives he made them up. The fear was held in place because he did not see that he was the author of the dream and not a figure in the dream. So I picked that quote because it actually touches on the two areas. The first thing, what is a miracle? Well, a miracle establishes that you dream a dream and that its content is not true. So, what that means is that there is an apparent happening of a meeting here today. There is nothing appearing as something which means absolutely nothing at all. And so there's an apparent world out there, worlding, but it's not real. You made it up. I, Keith, didn't make it up. Consciousness, the split mind, made it up. The one split mind made it all up. So this apparent body <laughs> and separate self is part of what's made up. 
as is what you think of yourself. Made up. It's just nothing apparently appearing as something, which means nothing. So, workbook lesson number one, nothing I see means anything at all. Well, there are no exceptions to that. And there are no exceptions to that because the miracle establishes you dream a dream and its content is not true. How could figments, imaginary figments, <laughs> how could they mean anything? How could an illusion mean anything? The statement of the atonement is that separateness never happened. There is no such thing as separateness in creation. So let's take another quote from the course. This is from the workbook and it's lesson 132 and it's paragraph six. But it is pride that argues you have come into a world quite separate from yourself, impervious to what you think, and quite apart from what you chance to think it is. There is no world. This is the central thought the Course attempts to teach. Not everyone is ready to accept it, and each one must go as far as he can let himself be led along the road to truth. He will return and go still farther, or perhaps step back a while, and then return again. So, you know, lesson one in the workbook says, you know, nothing you see means anything. And it doesn't mean anything because it's not real. You dream a dream and its content is not true. And this is a crucial, <laughs> crucial understanding for us as course students. And it's one we tend to hear and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's nice. And then push it way off to the side. And go out there and make the whole thing very real. There is no world. That's the central message this course attempts to teach. Now, Jesus is acknowledging that many of us <laughs> are going to struggle with understanding that nothing is real. Every apparent thing is just nothing apparently appearing as something. But it's only apparent because separateness never happened. That's the movie. Let's take another reading from the course. This is from chapter 20, The Vision of Holiness. It's section 8, The Vision of Sinlessness. Judgment is but a toy, a whim, the senseless means to play the idle game of death in your imagination. Now, the game of death is thinking that you're a body, uh, thinking you're a separate self, which will die, uh, which has got nothing to do with what you are. Uh, judgment is but a toy, a whim, the senseless means to play the idle game of death in your imagination. Uh, judgment is looking at some at nothing, apparently appearing as something, and having an opinion on whether it's good or bad. So Jesus follows up lesson one, nothing I see means anything at all with lesson two. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. That has to be true because it has no meaning. So whatever meaning I've given it, I have made up. Nothing means anything. Because separateness isn't real. <laughs> so let's take another quote. So I, I guess with those first quotes, let's talk about that then in the context of apparent suffering in the world. Um, so if we are triggered by animal suffering, um, we believe that the nothing believe, 
the nothing, apparently appearing as something, means something. And we've we've put a meaning on it. We've said God's son is a body, Christ is a body, and can die. We've said separate selves are real. The separation has happened. And then what we do is we become the unhealed healer. And so you'll regularly hear this catch cry in the course community. We're supposed to become miracle workers. We're supposed to go out there and make the world better. And that's just um, that's just a holy ego. Ego is nothing but the sense of me. Me the sinner. Or me the hero. Fixing the world. Me the worst person in the room. Me the best holiest person in the room. That's fixing everything. And saving everyone. And doing miracles. It's all just the sense of me. That's not what a miracle is. The miracle reminds you that you're not what you think you are. And neither is the world. The miracle is looking at an apparent something, the devastation, and knowing it's nothing. There's no need for me to have a judgment on it, that it's good or bad, or right or wrong, or good or evil, or cruel or kind. It's just something that apparently is. It's what apparently is happening, but it's not true. Jesus says that, you know, consciousness, which is individuality, <laughs> the separate self, um, Jesus says it's nothing but a faulty formulation of reality. Now, reality is God. Reality is love. And so consciousness and all the dreams of consciousness of bodies and separate selves and stories and eons and time, all of it. It's just a faulty formulation of reality with no effect on reality. It's a faulty formulation of love with no effect on love. And our job is to know that our reactions to that which is meaningless and not real, we are projecting them there. We've decided in advance what our reaction will be to what means nothing. And then we'll arrive at it and have the reaction that we set up for ourselves. And that's what Jesus means when he says um, projection makes perception. Perception is interpretation. Judgment. Is it good or bad? Is it right or wrong? So nothing has any intrinsic meaning because it doesn't mean anything because it's not real. The world is a dream and that's what the miracle establishes. It doesn't set us off trying to fix dreams. It connects us with what we are. In truth, in the Holy Spirit, at least it reflects truth and consciousness. And then we see the truth of the world, that there is no meaning to it. There is just the nothing appearing as something, only apparently appearing as something. But the nothingness, that's the holiness. That's God's one holy, innocent son. That is what reflects the truth of our identity in consciousness. The nothingness, the unchanging. Again, Jesus, you know, over and over in the course tells us if it changes, that's not true. If it changes, it's not you. If it changes, it's not your brother. 
It's illusion. It's something only apparently appearing as something. And so our job to see the real world um, is undoing our projections. The world doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything because it's not real. It's a dream. And its content is not true. However, it is apparently made out of the dreamer's mind. And though consciousness is the domain of the ego, it's also the domain of the Holy Spirit. And so consciousness, seen right-mindedly, is what's holy. And all you're seeing is formulations of consciousness that have no effect on consciousness. And consciousness is just a faulty formulation of God with no effect on God. So everything is just a faulty formulation of love with no effect on love. And what's blocking us from seeing the love behind all the only apparent happenings is the reactions we're projecting there in order to have. And that's what we're undoing in the course. And so in the real world, you look upon the world without any judgment or interpretation of it, without putting any meaning on it. It is simply what is. What is apparently happening. And it means nothing. Because it's not real. God's one holy innocent song, consciousness, seen right mindedly, is like the Play Doh, the modeling clay, out of which forms apparently arise, they're modeled, but they're not real. It doesn't matter how many things you model out of modeling clay trees, people, houses, plants, rocks, grains of sand. It's, it's just modeling clay. So as Jesus says, the forms the broken pieces seem to take mean nothing. For the whole, the modeling clay, God's one holy innocent son. So the forms the broken pieces seem to take mean nothing. For the whole is in each one. It's all modeling clay. It's all innocent holiness and love. It's just apparently appearing as something that can't exist. That's how we practice the course. So let's take another um, paragraph here. This is chapter 21, Reason and Perception. Uh, it's section four, the fear to look within, and it's paragraph three. What if you looked within and saw no sin? This fearful question is one the ego never asks. Because you see, the ego thought system says that we are so awful in our separateness. Our very being as separate um, is a sin. It's not even what we've done or what we do or what we'll do, it's that our very existence as something separate means oneness was murdered. And so the very fact that I exist as a separate self says that I'm sinful and damned. That's the ego thought system. But the one question the ego never asks is, what if you looked within and saw no sin? Why is there no sin? Because there's no separateness. There's no separate self to be guilty. Oneness was never destroyed. It's all that is. Everything else is just a faulty formulation of oneness with no effect on oneness. And you who ask it now are threatening the ego's whole defensive system too seriously 
for it to bother to pretend it is your friend. Those who have joined their brothers have detached themselves from their belief that their identity lies in ego. A holy relationship is one in which you join with what is part of you in truth. So again, you know, you can spend your whole life believing that you're a separate self, that you're an ego. As Jesus says in Lesson 93, the self you made is not the son of God. And nothing it does or thinks means anything. It's neither bad nor good. It is unreal. Nothing more than that. And so we can spend an entire imaginary life uh, thinking we're the ego, but it doesn't make it true. You're just temporarily deluded about your reality thinking you're a person. Okay, let's take another reading. The ego, and again, ego is just the belief in separateness. The ego is idolatry, the sign of limited and separated self, born in a body, doomed to suffer and to end its life in death. It is the will, in inverted commas, that sees the will capital W, of God as enemy. God's will is oneness. So it is the will that sees the will of God as enemy and takes a form in which it is denied. God's will is apparently denied. Now, God's will cannot be denied, so it is only apparently being denied. <laughs> there is just nothing apparently appearing as something that can't be. Bodies. A world. Others. Separate selves. Okay, this is from chapter 30, The New Beginning. And it's um, section 8, Changeless Reality. Because reality is changeless, is a miracle already there to heal all things that change and offer them to you to see in a happy form, devoid of fear. It will be given you to look upon your brother thus, but not while you would have it otherwise in some respects. For this but means you would not have him healed and whole. The Christ in him is perfect. Now this, remember, Christ is changeless. Is it this that you would look upon? The changelessness in your brother? Then let there be no dreams about him that you would prefer to seeing this. What would the dreams be? That he's a good person, that he's a bad person, that he's a holy person, that he's an unholy person. He's a person that can be helpful to me or a person that's not helpful to me. He's a person that's hot or a person that's not. <laughs> that's the dreams. Things that change. So then let there be no dreams about him that you would prefer to seeing this. And you will see the Christ in him because you let him come to you. And when he has appeared to you, you will be certain you are like him. For he is the changeless in your brother and in you. So Christ is changeless. So everything that's going on in your mind that's changing, that's not you. It's not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. <laughs> um, it's just unreal. It's just unreal. Only the changeless is true in you and your brother. So we're not being told to go out there into the world and start healing illusions. 
healing bodies. Okay. We're asked to look upon devastation and know it's false. And that changes the world. But again, the unhealed healer sees a world that's in a terrible state and that needs fixing and that needs miracles done to it. And it makes illusions real, reinforcing error and goes about trying to fix them because I'm so much of a holier ego than everyone else. Because I'm enlightened ego. <laughs> That's the trap. That's the spiritualized ego trap. There's nothing asked of us other than to see that the something apparently happening means nothing. It's not good or bad. It's not right or wrong. It's an illusion. And we're asked to see the changelessness of Christ behind everything. which is the changelessness that you are. So we don't save the world. The world is just a projection. We save ourselves from illusions. And that's what makes the difference. We look on a world knowing it's not true. So if we're visiting a friend in hospital, that doesn't mean we start reading them The Course in Miracles and beating them around the hospital room for being sick or thinking they're a body. Okay, <laughs> that means you go to the hospital and you act normal. But you know it's a dream. You're not a body. Nothing I see means anything at all. None of the content is true. What you are is not a body. It's not an insane voice talking to itself. It's not something that can die. What you are is awareness. Because that is the changelessness in you. And that is the changelessness in your brother. And that's what's in your mind. Your job is to have no upset about illusions. Or at least when the upset happens to understand, I'm never upset for the reason I think. I am not upset because a friend is in the hospital. I'm not upset because a friend is dying. I'm upset because I think I am a finite separate self and body. And I think my brother is the same. I'm attacking the Christ, my identity as the Christ I am. And because I've done that, I'm now attacking Christ a second time to see him as a body in a hospital. To see the nothing apparently appearing as something and make it real. But it's not real. The miracle looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees, it's false. What does it have to do with awareness? There is no such thing as the son of God in a body. No such thing. Awareness is not in the body. The body is in awareness. Nothing's in a body. And it's only if you misidentify as a body that you will start seeing Christ as other bodies. Otherwise, it's all just nothing temporarily appearing as something that means nothing. <laughs> Okay, this is chapter 30, the new beginning, changeless reality. The miracle is means to demonstrate that all appearances can change because they are appearances. So again, it is all just nothing apparently appearing as something that's not real and doesn't mean anything. So again, 
A miracle is means to demonstrate that all appearances can change because they are appearances and cannot have the changeless reality entails. The miracle attests salvation from appearances by showing they can change. If it's changing, it's not your brother. If it's changing, it's not you. Your brother has a changelessness in him beyond appearance and deception both. It is obscured by changing views of him that you perceive as his reality. That's us seeing him as a, as a, as a healthy body and an unhealthy body, as a living, vibrant body, as a dying body, as a comfortable body or a body that's in pain. That's your dreams about what your brother is. Again, the changelessness, the awareness that your brother is, what is not changing, that's what's true, or at least it reflects truth and consciousness. And so your brother's personality, is it changing? Of course it is. <laughs> is it true? No, it's your dream. It's what you're projecting onto nothing seeming to appear as something, a body, a separate self. Let's take another one. This is chapter seven, the gifts of the kingdom. And this is section three, the reality of the kingdom. This is why the ego is insane. It teaches you that you are not what you are. So there you go. What you are is changeless. Everything changing is not you. And that's why Jesus says in lesson 93, why would you not be overjoyed to learn that all the evil you think you did was never done? Why was it never done? Because you're not your thoughts and you're not the body's actions. Why would we not be overjoyed to learn that all the evil we think we did is never done? Because it means there's no me that I think that I am. means there is no separate self, Keith. And nothing it thinks or does means anything. It's unreal. And nothing more than that. And so our path, our imaginary path, <laughs> it's another something, only apparently appearing as something. <laughs> um, our spiritual path is about having our daily forgiveness practice bring us back to what we are as the changelessness in our mind. That's what forgiveness should do. And from there, we see the changelessness as the truth of all apparent happenings out there. That's how the world is saved. It's saved from you. It's relieved of your projections. <laughs> That's giving meaning to it. That's trying to make Christ into bodies and separate selves, suffering and dying. Killing itself and everyone else. Evil. Good. <laughs> and none of it's real. You know, Jesus says in the course that it's only the past that makes us see our brothers as different. Without that, we'd see them all as the same and the same as same as us. And what he means by that is the past has apparently <laughs> taught us preferences. I like people who are funny. I don't like people who think they're funny. I like people with blonde hair. I don't like people with blonde hair. I like people that are good to their friends. 
I like people who are a bit of a laugh. Can someone get Esther's microphone muted? Perfect. Um, she is muted, but it's still coming through as, as though she isn't muted. Oh, okay. Well, we'll carry on and hope it gets fixed. Yeah. It's not really happening. It's just an apparent happening. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, not entirely sure where I was there on my train of thought, uh, but let's pick it up. Our, our, our task is to know that we are changeless, the changelessness. And that means we have to learn what we are as awareness. Now, here is the thing. You are awareness. <laughs> you are consciousness. There is no separate self there whatsoever. You know, Diana. Uh, went through a process with me last time where she could see this. Um, again, others of you that do private coaching with me have done the same thing. Um, it's the first thing I want to establish is that there's no evidence that the body is you. And there's no evidence that the insane voice talking to itself is you. There's another quote I should have um, dug out earlier on. Let me see if I can quickly dig it out now without having loads of radio silence. Um, when I do these searches on my Kindle, it's the search results are too strict and too narrow. And when I do it on the, um, uh, the Of Course in Miracles searchable, <laughs> the search results are too big. Um, I wanted to find the quote where Jesus just says, well, here's one. Your will is not the ego's. That is why the ego is against you. So your will is not the will of a separate self. Anyway, let's go and try and find the one I wanted. There's an interesting quote from chapter uh, 11. The ego is nothing, whether you invite it in or not. It doesn't matter if there's an ego. It doesn't matter whether you think you are a separate self or you're not. It's nothing. Hmm. Oh, look, it's taking too long. Let me paraphrase. Um, Jesus says, you define your goals in terms of the ego's goals in the world, but the ego is not you. So the ego has wants and needs and clinging and, you know, holding on to and fighting against and resisting and um, preferences and aversions. And, um, and Jesus is saying, none, that's you. It's not what you are. That's changing. You are the changelessness. Everything that's changing is a delusion. And so again, right-mindedness is looking at the wrong mind without judgment. We could say right-mindedness is knowing you're in your wrong mind. Separate. Uh, as Ken says, the decision maker joined with the Holy Spirit is a non-judgmental observer of the ego. So you don't have to do anything about the body. You don't have to do anything about the insane voice talking to itself in your mind. Um, you just have to know it's not you. And do that now. Just for now. Just for now. Accept. That whatever thoughts, feelings, beliefs, um, hatred for me for saying these things, <laughs> love for me for saying these things, <laughs> whatever is going on, just accept just for now. It's not you. It's not you that's saying it. It's not about you. It's not for you. It's all just ego ramblings. And so if none of that's you, what are you that's not that? And you'll feel a peace apparently arise in your mind. 
a presence, just a still other presence, a nothingness. I say it apparently arises because it's there all the time. But it's overlooked. So you, this awareness, this presence, this peace, that's not the madness that's going on in the head. That's what you always are, the changelessness. But that gets overlooked and gets an awareness apparently gets mixed up with the ego's thoughts and feelings and stories and past and future and beliefs. And then it's like from there, awareness is apparently veiled from itself by this activity of identifying with what it's not. But there's only awareness. So there's no such thing as a person. There's just awareness, aware of itself, which is that presence in your mind. There's just that. Or there is awareness apparently mixed in with ego thoughts, feelings, and stories and thinking it's something it's not, which is a person. But there is no person. That's a delusion. You know, yes, nothingness is apparently bodying. Nothingness is apparently talking. Nothingness is apparently you know, making stories. <laughs> um, but it's not real. You know, nothingness is apparently thinking. But there's no thinker. Because there is no separate self. This is what Jesus is saying to us. There's no separate self there. There's just... The awareness you are in the Holy Spirit, and there's just one awareness because God has one holy, innocent Son. So you don't have to do anything to be what you are awareness. There is nothing to become, there is nothing to train for, there is nothing to cultivate. There is only letting go of what you're not. So people tie themselves in knots over awareness. This awareness that I'm supposed to be. And, and, and you see, this is just I, the separate self that doesn't exist. How do I cultivate awareness? How do I, the separate self that isn't real, how do I experience awareness? Well, the separate self can't experience awareness. Because there's no separate self. <laughs> there's only thoughts apparently happening. You know, there's apparently thinking, but there's no thinker of the of it. It's just thinking. It's just the ego's, you know, it's just, it's a formulation of reality where it seems like thinking is happening. Um, And there's just feeling, but there's no feeler. There's just experience, but there's no experiencer. There's just the awareness we are. And Jesus teaches this three ways in the course. Um, certainly in the song of prayer, it is you remember what you are and what you are, all your brothers are. That's a holy relationship. He also teaches it that you can only find what you are in your brother. Now, again, you see, because that means there's no more separate self. <laughs> what, what is true in my brother is the only thing that's true in me. Well, so much for the separate self that's different. Um, and then the third way he teaches it is even if you can't feel it in yourself, <laughs> find it in your brother and you'll find it in you. So he kind of teaches it three ways, and they're all true. Because there's just one thing, one nothing apparently appearing as something. And if consciousness is wrong-minded, it believes in the multiplicity of things. 
and the hierarchy of illusions. That one thing is good and one thing is bad. That one thing is preferable and one thing is not. And if consciousness is right-mindedness, is right-minded, I should say, it just sees the one holy, innocent nothingness behind all apparent something. It sees the same thing behind the illusion of Gandhi that it sees behind the illusion of Hitler. Those are just stories, apparent formulations of love that have no effect on love. So, again, there is nothing for us to learn about in order to be what we are. That's why Jesus says it's a journey without distance to a goal that's never changed. How could there be a distance to yourself? What you are is awareness of the Holy Spirit. There can't be. If you think there's a distance, if you think it's in the future, or that you need to do something to get it, then that's not it. There's no distance. It's the most intimate thing about you is your awareness. It's the part of your mind that has never changed from you are one years old until you're 90. It's the unchanging. It's the changeless dwelling place. It's the quiet center. It's the stately camp. It's there now. You don't have to put it there. You don't have to do anything um, to make it available to yourself. It's what you are. And all you have to do is let go of what you're not. And how do you let go of what you're not? The thoughts, the feelings, the stories. You drop all resistance to them. You allow everything exactly as it is. As Jesus says, uh, allow all things to be exactly as they are. And the minute you do that, the minute you let the thoughts and feelings do whatever they're doing. And the story's story in. And the minute you just let it be that. You know what you are and it's not what you're looking at. The silence comes. The stillness comes. The awareness that you are always in the present moment here now. The changelessness. You let go of everything you're not in the allowing of it. No trying to change it. No trying to fix it. There's nothing to do with it. It's not you. You don't have to fix anything. You don't have to change anything. Let all things be exactly as they are now. Let all your ego's thoughts and feelings and wants and fears, and anxieties, and hatred. Allow it to be exactly what it is. And what you are, non-judgmental awareness, tells you of itself. It's the experience you have in allowing. And the thing that we've been talking about that people have found very helpful is this welcoming. So what is welcoming except a dropping of all defenses? A letting things be. What does it matter if your ego is livid? What does it matter if your ego is murderous? What, is, what does it matter if your ego is terrified? What does that have to do with you? The ego isn't you. You know, there may be a fearing going on, but there's nobody there fearing. It's just the ego. And it's not you. You're awareness. You are awareness even when you are absolutely convinced you're a person. Because there's no such thing as a person.
there's only ever awareness. Either knowing itself and knowing that is the truth of everything. Or there's awareness apparently not knowing itself because it's identified with an ego thought system that isn't true. As a me that's not there. A guilty me, a terrified me, an unhappy me, a hating me. There's no me there. You're always awareness. As Jesus says in Lesson 93, light and joy and peace abide in you because God put them there. If you don't know that, that's just because you're identified as something that isn't you. It's in the allowing of all things to be exactly as they are, what you are tells you of itself. It's awareness. In the beginning, it feels like peace, like stillness. And in time, it reveals itself as joy and love. And all the rest of it is a dream of a me that's not true. And that light and joy and peace is the only truth in your brother. Everything else, personality, why he's good, why he's bad, why he's a good person, why he's a bad person, that's your dream. And you're only dreaming that dream of your brother because you're dreaming that you are something you're not first. You have attacked the Christ in you, the changelessness, to identify with the changing. That's not true. And because you've done that, you now have to make an ego for all the movie characters out there that are not Christ. All the bodies that are just nothing apparently appearing as something. <laughs> and you're going, you're a separate self. There's no separate selves. There's just awareness. There's just the peace. There's just the stillness. And we effortly slip into what we are as awareness in the Holy Spirit with allowing. Non-judgmental witnessing. A total allowing. Fighting nothing. And instantly, there you go. Salvation. That's the little willingness of A Course in Miracles. All we're asked to do is join with the Holy Spirit as a non-judgmental observer, awareness, and look at the ego without judging it. And that's all that's required. Because the minute you look at the ego without judging it, you experience what you are that's not the ego. And all the upset collapses. All the ego thoughts fall like the house of cards it is. Because the thoughts aren't being thought by anyone. <laughs> They're not about anyone. It's just thoughts happening. But nobody's thinking them. You are what you are in the Holy Spirit, which is awareness. And there's no separate self there. No matter how deluded you are that you're a separate self and that you're a body, and that you were born in a certain way and that your life has gone a certain way and it's all just stories that have nothing to do with what you are as awareness. It's all just nothing apparently appearing as something. It's all just love. All your hopes and your fears and your hatred, it's all just a a faulty formulation of love which has no effect. There is just the love out of which it seems to arise, <laughs> by which it's known, and out of which it's made. Okay, I think we have a good few questions in the chat box, Iga, Eli, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll take a few of those. Okay, um, this is from Florentia. 
she says, hi, Keith, a question. Do I have to ask for miracles to Jesus to change my perception? There's a few ways I could answer that. <laughs> Look, here's how you know I teach it. In the Song of Prayer, Jesus says, in the beginning rungs of the ladder, petitioning prayer is helpful. Okay, because it gets you on the right ladder. It has you understand that there is a, a different presence in your mind that's not the separate self. There's a different presence there. It's awareness. It's the Holy Spirit. It's what you are. At least it reflects the truth of what you are in consciousness. Okay. And, and in the beginning, petitioning prayer is helpful just to get you on the right ladder. You know, with a different teacher, the stillness instead of the noise. Um, but as you as you move up the ladder, Jesus is going, you have to come to the realization that petitioning prayer is not where it's at. It's a form of propaganda for illusions. You know, the miracle is the change in perspective. Jesus made that really clear in our quotes today. It looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees is false. It establishes you dream a dream and its content is not true. So do, do you have to ask for that? No, of course not. Because Jesus, Holy Spirit are just symbols for the stillness. The love that's there. The peace. The changelessness. That is the truth of every apparent thing. That means nothing. And so by all means, look, if you want to do petitioning prayer in the beginning, that's great. But we got to get beyond that at some stage and understand prayer is joining. That's what Jesus teaches us in the song of prayer. Prayer is joining. You know, again, the miracle establishes you dream a dream and its content is not true. Well, Jesus was a content in a dream. Jesus isn't true either, just like Keith isn't true. Just like forensic isn't true. It's just a faulty formulation of reality. It's a faulty formulation of love with no effect on love. There was never anything other than Jesus, to, to Jesus other than love. There's nothing to Keith other than love. There's nothing to Hitler other than love. There's nothing to Forensia other than love. All the rest of it is just nothing apparently appearing as something. But only apparently. Because only love is real and separateness never happens. That's the statement of the atonement. So, you know, we need to get ourselves on board with this idea that we're taught in the Song of Prayer, which is that as we ascend the ladder, it's about us joining. It's joining with the Holy Spirit. What instantly joins us with the Holy Spirit? Allowing. Let the ego knock itself out. Let the thoughts knock themselves out. Let the hatred and the bile, let it knock itself out. It's not you. If you allow it, you separate what you are out from that nonsense. And you feel what you are as the presence and the Holy Spirit. Well, that's joining. That's the answer to everything. What do I do next? Nothing. When you experience yourself as that which allows, you have no problems, you have no lack, you have no need, and you see that truth in everyone, every apparent someone that's just nothing appearing as something, which means nothing. Let the movie rage on. The miracle establishes the content is not true. It looks on devastation and says it's not true. Only this, what is in me, that allows. 
that's what is true or reflects truth and consciousness. And that's it. <laughs> that's it. The world is saved. Because there is nothing to the world other than this allowing, this stillness, this peace, this no thingness. Only appearing as something that means nothing. So the miracle is joining with what you are and you will instantly do that through allowing. And lots of people find welcoming as a helpful way of doing that. Okay, what's next, Eli? This is from Esther. Uh, you were talking about awareness when she put this question up. It says, is it like when we go off in a daydream? No, because in a daydream, you're not aware either. Um, and a daydream is no different than the trance of the personal self. Because the trance of the personal self is that thought is happening, feelings are happening, stories are getting concocted, apparently. And then there is a thought that says, I'm the one having these. There's no one having them. That's just thought. The ego is just a thought made itself that doesn't exist. It's just wispy nothingness. When you look for it, it's not there. So the minute you allow the ego, the minute you allow it, you are what you are, always here now. And you look for the ego, you look for the separate self, and it's just it's not there. It's just this peaceful awareness. And you look at the thoughts. And you look for the one that's thinking the thoughts, and there's nobody thinking the thoughts. It's just the ego's thoughts. It's just the ego thought system of separateness. And there was never anyone thinking them. There was never anyone feeling them. It was just thought, I'm the one thinking that. But you're not. Awareness isn't. Hmm. Read me the question again, Eli, to see if I've covered it properly. <laughs> Is it like when we go off in a daydream? Ah, okay, yes. So no, no. Because a, day a daydream is an apparent um lack of consciousness or lack of awareness um there's no such thing as a lack of awareness it's just apparent um and like i say it's no different than you being in the trance that you're a person whereby thought is happening and feeling it is happening and you're going oh my god these are my thoughts and these are my feelings well that's just a trance as well that's that's another daydream it's just the dream that there's a me the separate self the hero of the dream uh but it's not true either <laughs> It's not truer than your daydream. Because what you are is the changeless. That's what you are. So a daydream is changing. And so even if you think about a daydream you had, is that daydream you? Or are you just the awareness of that daydream? And the story of you the separate self up until this point in time, the birth and the family life and the drama and the sibling rivalry and the meeting of the love of your life and the marriage and it turned into a crap show or it's still going and there was children and it was, you know, you did the best you could <laughs> in difficult circumstances and they don't appreciate anything. <laughs> and the story and the victimhood and... Is there anything to that story other than the awareness of it? Is it anything other than a story playing? And are you that story? Or are you the awareness of that story? 
completely unqualified and uncolored by it? Is it not just a faulty formulation of the peace and love that you are with no effect on the peace and the love? All right, what we do next, Eli? <laughs> okay, we've got uh, one more question in the chat and then we can go to Marina. Perfect. Or Marianne, I'm sorry. Marianne, yeah. <laughs> yes. I have heard it said, this is from Kirsty. I have heard it said that people are taking less and less time to wake up from the dream. What used to take eight years of serious practice now takes two, for example. And this is a, the time and that this is the time collapse as more minds awaken. Do you agree with this? People don't awaken <laughs> from the dream because there's no people. So the idea that a person awakens is hugely problematic <laughs> because there's no such thing as a person. Um, that's, that's the delusion. That's the dream. There, there's no person. There's nothing to awaken. The awareness in you is already awake in the world's dream. That's why Jesus says enlightenment is but a recognition, not a change at all. Nothing changes. There'll still be ego thoughts and feelings. But the only thing that's different is you know it's not you. You're the stillness. You're the changelessness. And you can feel that now. It's the space between thoughts. It's the awareness that you are that is aware of all the thoughts and the feelings and the stories, but that isn't the thoughts, the feelings and the stories. The awakeness in you is what can, is what you experience yourself as when you allow all things to be exactly as they are. That's what it is to be awake in the world's dream. In the real world, there's only that. So the, the ego is gone. And then there is the undoing of consciousness, which is a whole other kettle of fish altogether. Um, and with the undoing of consciousness, there is the undoing of any sense of self, you know, because we, you know, we, we, we've been working on knowing ourselves as the right mind itself. But in the undoing of consciousness, the right mind awareness has undone the wrong mind, the ego, the separateness, the separate self. Um, and the sole purpose of the right mind is to undo the wrong mind. So the wrong mind being undone, the right mind awareness, it disappears. And consciousness, the mind that was split between the ego and the Holy Spirit, between separateness and awareness, it dissolves. And God is. So it's the final falling away of the delusion that there's a you, <laughs> that there's a wrong-minded you that's separate or a right-minded you that's, you know, uh, awareness. Um, and there's, there's a falling away completely because consciousness is the sense of a, a me that could be other than God. So nothing ever left God and nothing returns to God. Illusion just dissolves. It's the first illusion is that you are the thinker of thoughts. That any of the changing in your mind is anything to do with what you are. It's the first illusion to go. But then even awareness goes and consciousness goes and there is only what is. Just this. and no perception.
Um, but, you know, the course isn't even about that. <laughs> the course is about getting us to the real world. And so we're interested in our right-minded self, awareness. And that becomes the basis for our existence in the real world. Don't worry about the undoing of consciousness. The course doesn't even cover that. It's that that will happen automatically. Once you've achieved the one-mindedness of the Holy Spirit, then the last of illusion will start to melt. And then what can only ever be true is what's true, which is just this, God. But that takes care of itself. <laughs> Jesus says God takes the final step, even though he says God doesn't take steps. <laughs> that the reason for doing that is because there's nothing left except just this, God. So there's nothing to take a step. <laughs> it's the falling away of any last shred of anyone who could take a step anywhere because nobody ever stepped out from God and nobody steps back in. So this whole celestial speed up business that people talk about, that's just all part of the illusion, is it? The conversation we're having now is all just part of the illusion. The writing of A Course in Miracles is all just part of the illusion. Everything outside your house window is all just part of the illusion. <laughs> Listening to the ego as your teacher is all just part of the illusion. Listening to the Holy Spirit as your teacher is all just part of the illusion. It's all just in consciousness, and consciousness doesn't exist. So there's no hierarchy of illusions. But let's say that within the dream, <laughs> um, I think it's clear, um, to me at least, um, what Jesus meant when he talked about a celestial speed up. Because this message that A Course in Miracles is giving us is the exact same message that's coming from everywhere. Now, people who want to see the Course as a new religion will not agree with that. Um, they want to make the Course special. <laughs> um, but if you really understand the Course, in fact, let me say this, you don't really understand the Course until you can see this same message everywhere. Until you can see it as the message that's there in Advaita Vedanta, as Bill Tetford did, when you, you see it as the same message that Byron Katie is bringing and Eckhart Tolle is bringing, this idea of awareness and presence and it dissolves the ego, it's the same message. You know, a course, the course gives us so much more information and so much more explanations and there's an actual training to experience yourself as awareness. So it's not like other paths where they would say, well, you know, it's just going to happen when it happens. If it's going to happen, that you'll you'll awaken to the awareness that you are. The Course in Miracles gives 365 lessons for you to experience yourself as the awareness that you are in behind the ego. Um, but the idea, how do we undo suffering? Byron Casey, um, Michael Singer, uh, Eckhart Tolle, Rupert Spira, you just name it out there. Everyone is giving you the same message. You are not what you think you are. You are not a person. You are awareness, not a body free and still as God created you. The ego is not you. Same message everywhere. And I, I, I don't think there's ever been another period in time where that what were such an ubiquitous message is just coming at everyone from every direction. And so to me, in the dream, <laughs> um, when the nothing apparently happening as Jesus <laughs> spoke to the nothing apparently happening as Helen, and there was a nothing apparently appearing as a chorus, and that statement which is nothing apparently appearing as something. Um, within the dream, it's true. There is a celestial speed up. But again, it's just a story. But that's for the end of consciousness. Now, we use right-minded illusions to undo wrong-minded illusions. That's why forgiveness is the final illusion. That's what Jesus calls it.
and why the Holy Spirit is a, is just a character in the in the dream. Does that make sense, Kirsty? Uh, it does, Keith. Yes, it does. Thank. I'll have to listen to this again two or three times in the week, which I always do anyway. But yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you very much for that. Thanks, Kirsty. So, Marianne, the stage is yours. Here we go. This is my first time here. And... Wow. Hope we didn't scare you off, Marianne. No, no, no. I've been doing this a while, and I've been listening okay. to these after the fact. And uh, I feel really nervous. I don't know if I have enough time Mar for this. Marianne, no, no, we've got loads of time. Uh, Marianne, um, can you just welcome the anxiety? I was sitting here trying to do that, you know. Just, just like... welcome, welcome the anxiety. And is the anxiety you? It feels like you... an imperative to, to speak on this and ask mm -hmm. you. So, well, well, before you ask me, um, can you just welcome the anxiety of being there? Can you yes. just drop all your resistance to it? Can you allow it? And is the anxiety you? Or are you the awareness of the anxiety? I'm the awareness. And can you find the one who's anxious? Yes, but she's not real. It would be a person, an idea of a personal self that would be anxious. So you are aware of a story of a one uh -huh. that is anxious. Are you that story or are no. you the awareness of that story? I'm the awareness of that story. And can you find the one the story is about? <laughs> no. There's just you awareness. Now we let you ask your question. <laughs> Perfect. I have a question about a section in the manual for teachers. And it's about the perceived purpose of sickness. And I would like to read some things to you and let you uh, help me or answer this. Sure. And can you give us a highlights version or like, you know, not... Yeah, like I'm loads just going to jump into cool. the first line I want to read is healing yeah. is accomplished the instant the sufferer no longer sees any value in pain. Who yeah. would choose suffering unless he thought it brought him something and something of value to him? And he talks about the faulty problem solving approach of sickness. Mm -hmm. Here is what I want to really read. The acceptance of sickness is a decision of the mind for a purpose of which, for which it would use the body is the basis of healing. And this is so for healing in all forms. A patient decides that this is so and he recovers. If he decides against recovery, he will not be healed. Who is the physician? Only the mind of the patient himself. The outcome is what he decides that it is. Skip down. The patient could merely rise up with, oh, he talks about special agents seem to be ministering to him. Magical Medicine. agents. Yeah, yeah. Yet they but give form to his own choice. He chooses them to bring tangible form to his desires. And it is this they do and nothing else. They are not actually needed at all. The patient could merely rise up without their aid and say, I have no use for this. There is no form of sickness that would not be cured at once. Mm -hmm. So the question? That feels true to me. Okay. Into my very deepest being, it feels true to me. Mm -hmm. And I have had experience because I have had 
a lot of pain and symptoms. Mm -hmm. And because this felt true to me, it drove me deeper and deeper into my mind. And in fact, coming into your teachings or explanations of things, it only reinforced that to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've had the experience of following your suggestions a little bit different ways before that. Mm -hmm. But having the pain be completely gone can hardly even feel my body. But then when my mind would turn back to, you know, believing I was a little personal ego, it's been a teacher for me. Okay. And so, um, we can see a very simple demonstration of that in um, the very fact that if you are a pharmaceutical company, you are not allowed to put any medicine on the market until it's been tested for efficacy against a placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And so when Jesus says, um, you know, magical aids appear to be ministering to him, um, that's where a patient gets a sugar tablet you know, for an illness that shouldn't be curable um, and told it'll cure them. Um, and then the, the patient gets cured. Um, so placebo is a really good example of exactly what Jesus That's is That's the very about thing that, very, you know, started me early and on believing mm -hmm. that, it, you know, that the mind and the beliefs had so much to do with it. Yeah. And then Jesus talks about the ego's use or purpose for the body and the Holy Spirit's purpose mm -hmm. and how it becomes, it starts out a learning device and then it becomes a communication device under the Holy Spirit's guidance. Mm -hmm. But a very important distinction in the course is that Jesus defines um, sickness as separateness. Mm -hmm. Um. And he makes an important statement where he says, the body needs no healing, but the mind that thinks it's a body is sick indeed. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is, it's massively problematic for us to find ourselves with some pain or an illness or a sickness. And then we go, oh my God, I did this to myself and I have guilt and you know, and then we have teachers telling us, okay, you need to like forgive. And we're like forgiven and forgiven and forgiven. And it's not working. I still have pain. And now I have guilt, guilt mounting on top of guilt. And Jesus says, you know, again, sickness is just guilt from separateness. <laughs> and what we do is mm -hmm. we just heap on, we heap on the guilt and we heap on the guilt and we feel inadequate. And what are we doing? We're staying in ego. And so the purpose of sickness is to keep us away from our identity as awareness. That's not a body. That's the purpose of sickness. And I then get this, all that, but yeah. after going through all that you described and the guilt and, you know, by, I finally come into contact with you saying over and over again, I'm never upset for the reason I think. Absolutely, yeah. You suck me right back to the mind mm -hmm. and recognizing the guilt, the guilt's not there about it now. Yeah, because guilt is I'm never real. Using it to look at how I use these various things that I've projected out on to guilt myself. I don't know how to explain it in a, you know, sure. expedient, expedient way. Yeah. I see how it so works with exactly what you're saying. Good. Excellent. So, um, but the thing is, you don't want to fall into the trap of checking whether there's been a miracle or not as regards <laughs> the condition of the body that has nothing to do with you. Okay. So you don't want to go checking. Oh, has the miracle happened? Um, is there still a pain there? Oh, no, there's been no miracle. The miracle. Yes, is I've, I've seen that thing. Yeah. And I'm so also the miracle. Learning, 
there uh, to do the welcoming just like everything else. Yeah, because the miracle is that you're not a body. That it's got yes. nothing to do with you. It's just nothing apparently appearing as something. The miracle is that you return to your identity as the changelessness, the awareness. And so there, again, am I the pain or am I the awareness of the pain? Is the pain not just an apparent something, you know, nothing mm. apparently appearing as something in or on the awareness that I am, the changelessness that I am? Um, and if we do that, that can certainly alter our perception of pain, even as far as a situation where we can get to a place where we don't feel pain. But that's not the miracle. The miracle is knowing you're not the body. And neither yeah. is anyone else. That's the miracle. There's a side effect where you may not feel pain. But that but that is not a miracle. And, and there's nothing brilliant about it because before anesthesia, um, you know, back in the past, uh, back in back in the wars, you know, soldiers were hypnotized uh to experience the cutting off of their legs with no pain. So, so that's not the miracle, right? It's no big deal that you can be pain-free and you go, oh, I've had a miracle. That's not a miracle. That's just nothing. Apparently appearing no, as something that means nothing. No, but it seems to be nothing. something Jesus talks about in the Course about when we lay the body aside, if you've healed the mind, you're not going to be sick. If, he, I, he um, if, I understand, if I understand, Marianne, what I am and that the body is just nothing, apparently appearing as something mm -hmm. that's laying the body aside that's laying the body aside because our task as students is to get ourselves to a place where the ego can die sorry where the ego where the ego dies before the body appears like it's dying mm -hmm. so, the, so the self dies now, the self never lived. There's no self there. There's no separate self there. It doesn't have a body. The body is just nothing appearing as something. And so and so, the laying of the body aside, the real meaning of that is the understanding that you're not the body. It has nothing to do with you. That's the miracle. And so be it. If there's effects in the dream based on that, of course, if you change the way you look at the dream, then what you look at changes. But that's not the miracle. The miracle is the restoration, the salvation of God's son, the restoration of what your identity is. That's the miracle. So don't get caught up in the magic. Don't get caught up in identifying with the body and having an investment in the body. You know, if the body's going to go through something excruciating, um, big deal. What does it have to do with you? Unless you're deluded that you're the body. You know, it's all very well to say um, that, you know, if you heal your mind and you don't need to be a victim anymore, um, then you won't attract victimhood. You know, lots of people would say that's where the course is going. You know, um, and that means Jesus failed the course. Because his last day was surrounded by people screaming for his blood and wanting a mass murderer let out of prison instead of him, that wanted to spit at him and throw stones at him. You know, that laughed at him trying to carry his own cross. You know, that was entertained by the flesh being pulled off his back by a cat um, of nine tails. And that saw the image of his body on the cross bleeding and suffocating to death slowly. And Jesus. Well, like you would see the animals that are used and. No, hang on, hang on, Marion. Hang on. And Jesus knew he wasn't there. Yeah. It had nothing to do with him. It had nothing to do with him. It doesn't matter what happens to the body. Because it's not you. That's the miracle. 
So, so it's wonderful to a point when you're still identified as an ego, it's nice to go, oh, look at this, th these nice things. The real miracle is knowing what you are. And when you know what you are, you know what the world is. And that's how you heal the world. So just don't lose sight of that, Marianne. Is that okay? I understand what you're saying. And it's not the first time that I've had this, you know, question come up. I just wonder why Jesus would say some of these things. The world does nothing to him. He only thought it did. Nor does he do anything to the world because he was mistaken about what it was. Herein is the yeah. release guilt and sickness both. For they yeah, are but one. Remember, sickness is defined as separateness and guilt. Yet to accept this release, the insignificance of the body must be an acceptable exactly. idea. Exactly. There's your key point. The insignificance mm -hmm. of the body. It means nothing. It is nothing appearing something. And, it, and, and nothing about the body means anything at all. I have given it all the meaning it has for me. But how can so, I make it insignificant if I'm taking pharmaceuticals and having surgeries and doing all those things you're not you none of that's happening to you your awareness and the holy spirit that's happening in a movie about a body but what does that have to do with you that's like the movie about jesus's body being brought to crucifixion and hung up but it had nothing to do with him it has nothing to do with you either so you use the miracle to return to what you are and you watch a movie about a body that has problems and that goes to doctors and that gets medicine and that gets better or it doesn't. And you know, it's got nothing to do with you. The miracle looks on devastation and it reminds the mind that what it sees is false. Not that it's a problem and it needs to be fixed. What does it have to do with the love and peace of the Holy Spirit? Nothing. So okay. I leave that with you, Marianne. I leave, with <laughs> I leave that with you. I leave that with you. I'm not totally satisfied in my mind with that. But and that's okay. I don't. That's okay. I just want to be real and how you know. I don't want to. Well, you haven't yet let go of identifying as a body, and that's perfect. That's fine. But again, the miracle looks on devastation and reminds the mind that what it sees is not true. It's false. The body needs no healing, but the mind that thinks it's a body is sick indeed. Jesus' body on the cross did not need healing. But if he thought he was on the cross, he would have been sick indeed. But he wasn't, and he wants us to be the same. And we can do that by allowing the movie to be exactly what it is, allowing all things to be exactly what they are, and you experience what you are that's not a body. So have a think about that, Marianne. So can we move on to Marina? Yes, and actually, Keith, if you do Marina and Elaine, you can draw the line there because there's no yes. more questions. There's no more the in the chat box. Yeah, because we've run late. Okay, Marina. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. You cracked me up, Keith. Uh, <laughs> Glad to hear it. Literally. <laughs> Be like busting a gut here and I just feel just so much appreciation and, and thank you for your your clarity and thank you for who you are that's letting all this uh non-resistance move through you uh, 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 it's just so grateful and I just crack up because Eli I mean there you were you mentioned my name before I even put my name up and I wasn't I didn't have in mind to put my name up but I, I put my name up when uh, when Marianne talked about like you know being nervous and it's like I, I wanted to go there I wanted to be mm -hmm. on that hot seat, which I did well after I put my hand up you know like yeah, yeah no that's that's not me I can sit back and watch that and uh so I, I don't I don't have any questions just a great big thank you and extending <laughs> oh thank you very much thank you very oh much. and Eli <laughs> just so in love with your dog Oh <laughs> we all are. We all are. <laughs> we, uh, she would, she would be Thanks safe so she much. Room with, 
like, <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, so yes, my first time and, and not my last, you know. Ah, uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome, Marina. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pleasure. Elaine, just unmute yourself. Hi, okay. Um, yeah, so when, when Mariana was talking, uh, I just had, you know, in 2019, I was in and out of psych hospitals. I had made some mistakes with my medication and put myself into withdrawal of benzodiazepines. So I would go to one psych hospital. They wouldn't treat me with withdrawal. I would go home and I would be suicidal again. I'd make another attempt on my life. I'd be sent to another psych hospital. Again, no help, sent home in withdrawal, suicide attempt again, back to a third hospital. And, and this is over now, got six weeks now in September and October of 2019. The third hospitalization after being there for about four weeks, them wanting to send me home and me saying, no, 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 don't send me home, don't send me home, uh, I'm not well. And uh, sitting there in these cold hallways, it used to be a prison, and they converted it into a psych hospital, but it still had bars around and, you know, very cold environment. And uh, suddenly, this strength arose in my mind and said, you are smarter than anyone here. You are strong. You need to get yourself together and get out of here. And I said, oh, my God, that's my Holy, that's the Holy Spirit. And it changed, it gave, all of a sudden I sat up, I said, I'm no longer a victim because I was reaching out, help me, help me, help me, somebody help me, you know, and then I realized that no, Elaine, nobody's going to help you. You're the one who can help you because it's your mind that's going to help you. So uh, after two more nights of not sleeping, I did get home and I still wasn't well, but I, uh, and then I thought, well, now what am I going to do? Because I'm still not well. I'm still suicidal. Hospitals can't help me. My doctor of 25 years is not giving me my medicine back. And then I got another thought, go to your family doctor. I called Uber because I could not function. I was having many seizures. I was suicidal. I got to him. He prescribed the medicine I needed. I, I got the prescription filled and that night the symptoms start abating and within a couple of days I was fine again and I'm you know I'm still taking my prescribed medicine that I've been on since um the early uh 90s so uh that was just an experience I had where I my mind could see my body as just and my 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 wrong mindedness as totally identified with the victim role and just being able to get a glimpse of it however brief it was it it uh it was real you know and i just wanted to share that thank you very much elaine um because you were never in any hospital and you never had any psychiatric problems and you um aren't on medication <laughs> and you aren't a body you are free you're as slow as god created you so as you can you just welcome all that story that's there in your mind now and can you just notice are you that story or are you the awareness of the story well i'm certainly the awareness of the story but i will say and does that, that exist now as anything other than a story in your mind I have to tell you, at times it seems very real. Yeah, but, but now, know. being here oh. now, Elaine, being here yeah. now, mm. what you are now, always in the Holy Spirit, present moment awareness, 
in this moment, the only moment there is, is that anything other than a story in your mind? No, no. And can you find the one the story is about? Well, it's about this lovely person. (laughs) Is this not just a story? Return to the awareness that you are in the Holy Spirit. There's a story about a lovely person, but are you that story or are you the awareness of that story? I'm the awareness, but yeah. Okay. I mean, my mom, okay. I know. No, 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 but let's. Yeah, you are the awareness. And is that anything other than a story about an ego that doesn't exist? No, it's nothing other than a story. The whole world is nothing other than a story, but it's still a hard story. Now, is that not just a story about a story that it was hard? Can you just yeah. welcome, can you can you welcome all of the emotions and the feelings that are there about the story? Can you just open yourself up on the inside and welcome all of it? Can you just allow I, it? I, I do that every morning. I lie there. Can you do it? I, can you do it now? Okay. Can you just no, no, but all you have to do is allow it. Welcome all that story and all those feelings and all that, whatever it is that's there, can you welcome it? Can you stand before it and open yourself wide up on the inside instead of contracting into it? Okay. And can you welcome any thoughts that you need to justify it or explain it or remember it or fix it or change it or hold on can you just welcome all of that can you just allow all of that to be exactly as it is and can you welcome any thought or idea that any of that has anything to do with what you are in the holy spirit that is invulnerable and changeless Mm -hmm. and can you welcome what's here now Mm -hmm. what's here now Len connecting connection of love stillness changelessness Mm mm-hmm That's what you are. You're not Elaine. You have no past, no future. You are the present moment. God's one holy, innocent son. It seems like, you know, it just seems like at times it takes a lot of strength to do that. And sometimes I get tired. Is that not just a story? And are you that story? Is it about you? Or are you just the awareness of that story happening? Awareness. Yeah. Because it doesn't take any strength to be who you are and what you are here now. It so takes it really all of our strength. It takes all of our strength when we leave the present moment to go into yeah. an illusory story of a past or an anxious fantasy about the future. That's what takes all of our energy. That's the paradox. Yeah. That that gets away from me. That's the paradox there. Yeah. I'm confusing so, the strengths of one with the strength of the other. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that, Elaine. Thank you for your commitment. <laughs> Guys, thanks a million for your attention for another Zoom meeting. I hope you got something useful out of it this week and uh, we'll all um, catch up in the group during the week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. 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 Thank you.